Hi folks, I'm so excited. I finally made it to DevOps Days Amsterdam. Every year I think, I really wish I were there in Amsterdam. And then I think, oh right, we're running DevOps Days Minneapolis in a couple of weeks. That might be a bad idea. Turns out, we're running DevOps Days Minneapolis in a couple of weeks. And, you know, of course I was late on ordering our t-shirts and the t-shirt sample showed up in Minneapolis to my sister. She's taking selfies of herself wearing it, asking me what I think, saying, it seems like they over inked it, you know? It feels a little gummy. And I'm like, these are the things I would not get just from them sending me a picture. So there is nothing like being there yourself. And so I'm really excited to be able to be here. Uh, computers are apparently difficult, but that's why I, I actually, I made the strategic decision for someone who wants to speak at tech conferences uh, to start dating the cute AV tech boy in 1997. Turns out that traveling with your own AV professional makes this a lot easier. So a lot less for you to worry about. Um, thank you so much, Joe. All right, I think we're ready to go. Uh, so. I pitched uh, cloud containers, Kubernetes, because I figured I would try to get all the buzzwords onto uh, one slide. And I'm, I'm really happy that this is what the organizers wanted me to talk about, because you may have noticed that these terms, these topics are hand-wavy enough that I can talk about anything I want. If you're wondering at this juncture, like, who is talking to us? Who is she? Um, let's see if I can get this to do a thing. Uh, this is... Uh, my name is Bridget. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I don't know. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I, it is the, uh, we hold our DevOps Days in Minneapolis in July, by the way, because it is the one month of the year Minnesota has never logged snow. So um, we figure we're, it's safe, we can talk people into coming to the frozen north then. Uh, I work at Microsoft. Uh, I work at Microsoft, and more on that later, but this is not a talk about Microsoft, and um, Microsoft has not uh, signed off on or endorsed or seen any of these slides. And I podcast with Arrested DevOps that uh, some of you may know Matt Stratton. He is going to be giving two talks here at this conference because he's much more of an overachiever than I am, apparently. And uh, it is a podcast about dev and ops and everything in between, so you can check that out. And I am actually the chief cook and bottle washer of this DevOps Days organization these days. Uh, Patrick Dubois is here somewhere. Where are you, Patrick? I don't see him, but he's here somewhere. Uh, and after, after running this uh, whole shebang for about five years, he said, you know, I'm good. I'm gonna do some serverless stuff. You, you can run this. So I think this year we have 64, maybe 65 events in on six continents. So if you uh, want to go to another DevOps days, if you want to run another DevOps days, if you want to run a DevOps days into Antarctica, um, please get in touch with me because that would be kind of cool. Okay, so outline for this talk. Uh, we've got, we got past, we got present, we've got future. I feel like when people give you an outline, it feels a little bit more like spoilers. It's like spoilers for the talk. Uh, I'm not gonna give you too many spoilers. We're just gonna jump into it. Okay, so every DevOps days, I feel like this DevOps days, it's the sixth year, probably a lot of you have been at DevOps days before. How many of you, uh, is this your first DevOps days? And we have at least 50 to 60% of the room, which is a slightly lower percentage than at some DevOps days, but we'll give you the, the TLDR of how we got here, which is, it was 2008, and Andrew Clay Schaefer, um, proposed an open space at the Agile you know, Systems Administration, or sorry, at the Agile Conference in 2008. He wanted to do an open space about Agile Systems Administration. Then he didn't show up for his own open space, and Patrick Dubois is the only person who showed up and had to go track him down at the party later and say, let's talk about this idea of applying the principles of Agile to the systems administration stuff that we know and love and you know, cry about all the time. And Patrick came back you know, to Europe and ran the first DevOps days in Belgium in Ghent. And we have Chris Bytart and we have a num number of other folks who were involved with making that happen. We're gonna hear from you later, a little bit later, Chris, I hope. Um, all right, during, during uh, open space, we're gonna have to hear from you. But this idea is not new, but it's definitely grown. And I think people are really excited about that. 
And the, probably the classic wall of confusion slide that Andrew Clay Schaefer used probably almost a decade ago in slides is one that I see a lot and I kind of want to argue with because I don't think this is really what it is. I think the wall of confusion is not just dev and ops. I think it's actually more like the people whose incentives are set up to maintain stability and the people whose incentives are set up to ship changes. And this is something you can actually control inside your organization by how you're um, rewarding people, by how you're measuring their progress, by how you're incentivizing them to make changes or uh, fear changes, or maybe make changes that don't go perfectly, but then you just keep iterating. You, you just roll forward. Because like, people like to talk about rollbacks, and I gotta tell you, rollbacks are a damn dirty lie, because we don't have time machines. Trust me, in the United States, if we had time machines, we would be using them right now. Like, we don't have time machines. What we do have is the ability to uh, move forward to a future state that we hope is really similar to the past state that we really wish we still had. And if you design everything so that you can roll forward to that future state faster, then you have a lot less tension between the people who want to make a change and the people who are like, I really don't like being paged at three in the morning. Okay, and I have spent some time being paged at three in the morning. Um, the, the last ops job that I had um, was in 2014, 2015, and I was uh, building out um, a streaming video site that was much like Netflix. If Netflix were much smaller and mostly Korean soap opera and started running Docker in production in October 2013, when like the main thing on Docker's website was giant letters and blank saying, under no circumstances should you run this in production. And we were like, YOLO. And uh, Drama Fever actually got acquired by Warner Brothers. So I guess YOLO sometimes works out. I'm not saying to do what we did. But uh, what I learned from that is that containers are pretty awesome. They solved a lot of problems for us in our deployments. They made everything a lot more repeatable and consistent, and we no longer had the problems that we had before of like some code that was on a dev's laptop, and that was the only other place it was, was also in production. Surprise, excitement, fear. So containers made it a lot easier for us to ship. Um, but at the same time, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, like containers do not magically solve every problem that you have. And I think that people get really excited about, you know, rub some, bug, rub some buzzwords on it and everything will be better. And that's not actually true. Because you get new problems like, for example, you're building your container images, uh, what are, you're updating your application, when are you updating the base layer for the image? Like you, you get some consistency, but does that, do you still, uh, pay attention to updating everything that you need to. So I have been doing this tech thing for a little while. Uh, these are pictures of my real textbooks. Uh, the first computer science class I took was a scheme class because Lisp, why not? Um, and I, I quickly found out that I, the best way to um, have time to work on my homework is to just work for the computer science department and run the labs that the other students were in. And as it turns out, uh, the faculty members gave all of us undergrads um, who worked for the CS department root on their computers because, I don't know, because it was the 90s and many things seemed like a good idea at the time. And what I, what I learned from that is that there was a, a heterogeneous explosion of various Unix systems. You know, I, I managed HPUX and AIX and Dynix PTX, anyone remember that? Um, systems. And it was kind of difficult sometimes to keep consistency between all of these systems that are so different from each other. And at the same time, people get really excited about the, all the container excitement that's happening right now, and I think, yeah, but you know, I was using zones, and I was using FreeBSD turret jails, and it's easy sometimes for some of us, and I think I can look out at the crowd and see some of you are about as old as me and have probably been doing this for a while and are thinking, this container thing, it's, it's overhyped right now, it's a trend right now, but we've done this before. And it's like, yes, we have, 
and some of us may have even played with LXC at the time, but when we started moving into a space that was a little bit better defined, a little bit more consistent, and a little bit more um, repeatable and usable for people who are not like your, uh, your biggest uh, Unix gurus, it ended up being a lot easier to get more people using containers. So like the, uh, I would say the, whatever you want to say about Docker Inc and whatever your opinions are of you know, that specific implementation, it's undeniable that they did an amazing thing in making container, containers usable for, um, for increasingly large values of everyone. So that brings us to Kubernetes. And when I went back and I looked, I couldn't believe that Kubernetes has actually been around for more than four years. And we think of it as like just the last couple of years being really popular, and that's true, but it's not actually new. And it's, I think that's another thing to remember, is like everything that, it, and I, I don't have a hype cycle slide in here, but you've all seen the Gartner hype cycle, hype cycle graph. And every single thing that everyone gets excited about, and it's the new shiny, is not necessarily new for everyone, but it becomes a lot more usable. I think that it's, it's really exciting right now to talk about container orchestration and to talk about like, you know, stateful storage on your, uh, you know, orchestration and, you know, all your, your service meshes and what have you is like the, the topic du jour. And I think it's important for us to remember that we don't go to work and say, today I really want to implement a Kuber, uh, you know, Kubernetes in a service mesh. Like that's not the goal. The goal is to accomplish whatever it is we're trying to accomplish in our organizations. And as much as we possibly are tempted to do a little bit of resume-driven development, it's really important to focus on the goals that we're trying to get to with this tool. Like, it's just a tool. Okay, so that, that brings us to approximately where we are right, ne right now, which I would say it is a, it is a pretty confusing landscape. Like, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in this space it's, it's hard for me to keep up with it, and I have no production server responsibilities, and keeping up with it is literally my job, and it's still difficult. So if you're thinking, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, and you're feeling a little, I have a lot to check on, just, just remember, like, Simon Wardley posted this um, earlier this year, and it kind of made me laugh, because when all the meltdown inspector thing was going on, and he was like, all right, how long do we think it's gonna take to patch if we're not using cloud, if we're using our private cloud? Um, and I think that uh, the timing on this is very telling because all of us have been through a couple of cycles now of this, oops, we have to reboot all the things, oops, we have to patch all the things. And realistically, sometimes that is difficult to keep up with. Like this is kind of one of those a lot of the reason that people are looking at uh, hitting a higher layer of abstraction than they were before is because it's really challenging to take care of your application and your users and everything in the stack all the way down to the metal. Like, that's a lot of work. So, and it, it's getting harder and harder. And it's also getting, and I think that this is, this is definitely true, it's getting so that I'm really sick of hearing about disruption because it feels really predictable. Like, if you play Settlers of Catan, you know the pirates are coming. This is not a surprise. It's going to keep happening. You might not know the exact timing, but you know it's gonna happen. And everyone who, you're, you're sitting there talking to your customers or your company about how things are different now, we have to make a change. It's like, and that's going to happen again. I, I'm sorry to tell you that the people who have an IT transformation initiative that is gonna conclude in Q3, like, good luck with that because transformation is not something you get to do once and be done with. Um, and there's also like a lot of organizations that still have a lot of siloing. I know Michael Ducey has done some great talks here about like the goat in the silo. Um, he's here somewhere too. But um, the idea that you're going to uh, be able to have your, your individuated sections of IT that can have separate responsibilities Again, good luck, have fun, because the, the mo I think the most important word in Conway's law is communication, in that you need to have not just run it all the way up and then down, but you need to have that collaboration across teams so that you're, 
you're not quite so um, misunderstanding of or furious at the people whose work, because they didn't understand your work, gets you awakened in the night. And there's also like a lot of uh, complexity that, and like I mentioned resume-driven development before, and I wanna emphasize there's a lot of complexity built into our systems that may not need to be there. Like even though it's tempting, and even though it's interesting, and even though it's fun, it's probably a good idea to resist some of the, we should just add something because. I remember I was a couple years ago in a meeting with um, a delightful young man who was explaining to me how he definitely needed to write a custom Erlang message bus. And I was like, why? And the, the reason, I said, to, to his credit, he said, the, the use case, the reason is that he really wanted to write an Erlang message bus. I'm like, okay. I mean, that's fair, that is something you wanna do, but is that going to get you, you know, to what you're trying to accomplish as, with the, in the timing that you want to accomplish it? I mean, this is, a good, again, back to the, when you're choosing your cloud stuff, it's really important to focus on what you're trying to accomplish. Like, not what the exciting tool you wanna use is, because that doesn't lead anywhere good. What that leads to is someone builds a, a house of cards and then they go get a new job on the strength of the exciting things they put on their resume and then other people at their organization have to maintain it or more likely replace it. So that's, that's something that's worth discussing. It's also, I gave a talk a few times last year where I provocatively titled it, computers are easy, people are, are hard, and you know that's a lie. Like you know that's not true. I mean, computers are hard and people are harder, um, but it's, I think it's sometimes uh, tempting to go with a narrative that like, as long as we fix the problems in our organization by deving some ops, the computer stuff will just kind of all come together. And we all know that's not true, but I think that that's a tempting narrative that we probably want to fight because the reality is that whatever you do day one, when you, when you ship that Erlang message bus that you've glued into your system for some reason with a what have you built sort of meme, at some point someone says, that was delightful, I'm glad that that shipped and worked, and now we need to update it 60 times, and now we need to ship the next version, and if you have something where you're like, I don't know how we got this working once, and I'm not excited about the prospect of trying to update it, like saying uh, cautionary things before that happens is probably wise, right? Because it's, it's very tempting to just try to build whatever is exciting. Like if somebody wants to go to microservices, for example, um, microservices are delightful and they also uh, are just moving the complexity around. A uh, former boss of mine, Tim Gross, likes to call it conservation of complexity. You're still going to have it. You just, it, you've, uh, you no longer have all of that IPC, now you have a bunch of network latency. Like, you still have it. So when somebody says that the next step for our, our architecture is to introduce microservices, like a very important question would be, what problem are we trying to solve? And is the complexity trade-off, is the complexity tax that we're paying worth it for the flexibility and being able to iterate at different speeds with the components? It, it very well might be worth it, but that's an important conversation to have before committing to a project that is definitely going to uh, increase your troubleshooting um, needs. So, all right, if, if you're thinking at this point, oh, wait a minute, Kubernetes is highly complex. Yes, yes it is. That does not mean you should not Kubernetes. I mean, you probably should, but it's probably a good idea to take a look at, um, like make sure if you're going to be responsible for Kubernetes, take a look at like Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way. It doesn't mean that you're going to run that in production, you're probably not. But taking a look at that, and we have a, a fork that you know, can run you through that on Azure too if you want to. Um, there's, uh, the new stack did a pretty good uh, overview of Kubernetes that what I like about it is there's a lot of overviews that have a lot of technical detail and this one's more of a 10,000 foot if you want to understand at least something about it. Um, I actually, I grabbed a few slides from their overview because I like the fact that it shows, all right, you have a control plane, 
you have a bunch of nodes. The control plane is running processes like uh, etcd is your distributed key value store because as it turns out, everything, including your, uh, you know, complex distributed systems, needs to have some kind of state, you know, like state where your customers and money live. Everybody wants to talk about stateless, and you're like, that's great, except everything we care about is in the state. So, um, but the being able to uh, interface to the API to control your control plane is one of those things that when you're playing with Kubernetes yourself, you're like. Cube control, kube cuddle, like whatever you want to call. What, let's have a lot of arguments about what we call things because that's fun. Um, you're interfacing with the control plane yourself, you're, or rather hitting the API endpoint. In reality, most people who are going to use your Kubernetes cluster aren't going to do that. So it's like, again, choosing the level of abstraction that you're working at. Um, and if you're looking at like <sighs> all of the choices that you have to make, um, with Kubernetes, like almost everything is, is highly unopinionated. Almost everything is highly pluggable, which means you can choose a different container runtime. You know, you can choose a different overlay network. There's like, there's a bunch of, ah, we'll talk about that. Um, there's a bunch of places that there are uh, options in there. And I would say in most cases, you're gonna wanna start with the most obvious choice because anything that you change to something, you know, slightly more specialized, slightly more opinionated or optional, there is going to be, again, the complexity tax and the overhead there. Like, for example, if you're using Kube Proxy and you're worried about, uh, you know, the overhead and the latency, there are plugins that you can use to change out for that. It's just a question of how many other people are using that because you probably, I'm guessing you don't want to be the only one using a specific matrix of Kubernetes options. It gives you a lot smaller community to answer questions for you. Okay, and uh, yesterday we did go through the Kubernetes 101 workshop, which was fun. And usually when you do workshops at events and then you go back to the office and you're like, I did this workshop, it was great. And they say, huh, uh, okay, please reproduce it for your coworkers. And you're like, it was great. So in this particular case, you can reproduce it for your coworkers uh, because I like to think of it as if Kubernetes is the democratizing distributed systems, um, our open source Kubernetes training um, that uh, Jerome Padazzoni, who I think some of you may know, um, created it and I ported it to Azure and have been adding a bunch of stuff to it. We have instructions in there right now for uh, AWS and for um, Azure and uh, pull requests accepted if somebody has um, some GCP or something else. And the reason that I bring this up is because I think it's kind of difficult to, to get a 101 on this stuff. Like when you're, when you're talking about something as complex as this, uh, there's so much detail there that it's kind of hard to know where to start. And also most of the one-on-one -on -one stuff is like, I'm using Minikube on my laptop. How do I jump from that to production? Because there's a pretty big gap there, starting with single node. Um, and I think that if you decide to run something like this inside your organization, trying to up-level your coworkers, it's, as techies, it's very tempting for us to want to have the like 60 different config options to start with. This is where you start, config to 60 different things. And that is not a good place for humans to learn. So it is a good idea to limit the complexity. Again, like when you're, when you're training people. So, so yeah, you can take a look at container.training if you wanna walk through the exercises we did in the workshop yesterday, um, or if you want to uh, run it inside your organization. So. That's that. Um, so that's kind of, we're in an area of a great deal of complexity right now. And I, I, wanna, I wanna do a little prognosticating, a little thinking about where we're probably going. Um, well, for starters, uh, we have, I think that there's, um, it's possible we live in the darkest timeline. It's possible that everything from here on out is going to be I don't know, some post-apocalyptic movie that they were entertaining when they were movies. They're a little bit less entertaining when we seem to be living in them. And that doesn't mean that we despair or that we give up or that we you know, stop doing tech. I actually think that 
the state of things in the world means that everyone in this room is empowered and responsible to do a lot to make the world better because you actually, you have the technology. Like, uh, you can build it and there are a bunch of things you probably don't want to and shouldn't build. But when you're looking at all the tools, all the technology you have, um, and I did not update this from, you know, like probably a month ago, and I'm sure that there's more stuff that I should have added. I'm positive that there's things that have been added. But this idea of trying to pick, and the CNCF website has the most current version of this, but trying to pick which of these things to use is a big problem. And this is again, like, look at when you're trying to decide exactly, you know, when you're trying to decide exactly which service mesh or exactly which distributed tracing or whatever to use, this is one of those things where you're gonna have great conversations here in open space and I highly recommend if you're not, if some of you have not been to a DevOps days before, it's possible you haven't done open space and if you want to have conversations with people who have used a bunch of this stuff, coming up here during open space proposal time and saying, I wanna talk about service meshes, I wanna talk about observability, that's actually, this is your opportunity to find out what the peers in your community have been doing in this space. So it's like, it's a really complex space. And as you can see, you know, Kubernetes is the one project that the CNCF has considered graduated so far, which means all of the rest of this is, is a, even more of a moving target than Kubernetes. And I gotta tell you, I ran a workshop yesterday and maybe like an hour or two after my workshop, which I was running on uh, 1105, they were like, Kubernetes 111's released. I'm like, great. That doesn't mean everything from the workshop yesterday is invalidated. It does mean that before I run it again in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna have to go through and see exactly what broke, because things always do. Fast moving open source projects. Um, but I think that that's like when you're looking at fast moving open source projects like that, right now everyone wants to talk about orchestration and that's only one piece, like everything else on that CNCF graph, you're gonna probably care about, and you also care about exactly how you connect it to all your existing systems. I'm guessing most of you are not operating in a completely greenfield environment. If you are, congratulations, because you're gonna have some leg legacy microservice, uh, microservices next week. And we all, we, if we have any success whatsoever, we have existing systems that matter and people like to call that legacy, and you're like, yes, the place where the customers and money live. It actually matters, we care about it, we care about it a lot. And so every new thing that we're trying to introduce, um, we don't get to introduce it in isolation and run it in this bubble where it doesn't have to interact with anything else ever. Like, that's, that's an exciting dream that we don't actually live that reality for the most part. And so it's, it's really important to think about how pluggable the stuff that you wanna add is in terms of the wider ecosystem, not just in the world in general, but at your organization. The stuff that already exists that people are already concerned about maintenance windows on, like, it still matters, right? Um, okay, but if, you're, if you are looking at exciting new projects or uh, projects that you might wanna work with, projects you might wanna watch, um, I'm biased, of course. Um, you can tell by the sparkly t-shirt that I work for Microsoft. And uh, these are three open source projects that some of my colleagues are contributing to. Um, but they are open source and free and other people contribute to them too. Um, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. So if you, if you are uh, installing a lot of applica applications on your Kubernetes clusters, and then you wanna keep track of which versions of which applications, in-house or not, that you're running, and then be able to bundle all of the configs and whatnot and basically have like templatized versioned um, you know, packages for your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, Helm is a good project to look at. Um, Brigade is for when you get really sick of all that YAML. Because I gotta tell you, if you start working with Kubernetes, like there, there's a content warning for YAML. Sorry, not sorry, there's lots of it. But if you're, if you're tired of it, or if you don't find that to be flexible enough, and you wanna actually write some code to go with your configs, uh, Brigade might be a project that would be interesting for you. And finally, Virtual Kubelet, and this is again one of those acknowledging the reality that legacy exists. Uh, the Kubelet is, um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but basically you use it to plug things into your Kubernetes clusters, and if you, if you want to 
have your uh, legacy systems or maybe like an entire different data center join your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there's, there's a little bit more detail. You can look at the vir virtual Kubelet website, and I know this is a bit of an art eye chart. I just wanted to illustrate that you can um, add things as a node to your cluster that can then accept workloads that uh, are not in any way Kubernetes-ish other than the fact that you can add them to your cluster. So that's, it's an interesting project to look at because of the flexibility and the, the potential of adding um, a bunch of your legacy systems to your clusters. Uh, this is um, a coworker of mine, Eric St. Martin, uh, is one of the founders and um, people who runs GopherCon. And he likes to say that like, you know, much like Halt and Catch Fire, Kubernetes is not the thing. Um, right now, people are excited about it. Maybe this time next year, no one will be talking about it, but probably not. But you know, Kubernetes is not um, our end game, right? Uh, any more than Docker or anything else that we've gotten excited about is our end game. It's the tool that gets us to the next thing that we're trying to do. And I think if you're if you're in tech long enough, you realize that like the the hype cycle comes and goes, the trends change, but the tools are a tool, nothing more. The, the, your, your people and your, to a lesser extent your processes are going to last a lot longer and matter a lot more than the specific tool that you're using. And that said, like, I like this quote from Laura Bell because we spend a lot of time in tech. Um, we spend a lot of time being excited about our proof of concept and being excited about getting that one thing happening, getting that one new thing rolled out. I think it's really important to remember that it's not just a question of rolling out the new thing, it's also a question of being able to maintain and update the new thing. Uh, Simon Wardley talks about this model of pioneers, settlers, and town planners, and I'm like, I'm definitely team settlers, and not just because I'm obsessed with Catan, but I'm, I'm definitely team settlers because it's great if you get something working once, and you know, it's, it's a lot more um, satisfying to keep it working and be able to update it and get uh, you know, the next end versions of it working correctly. And that's, we, I also keep talking about the future like it's going to exist and we aren't all going to be underwater in the next 10 years. And we'll see, I mean, we'll see, but I do think that if we are in this space, in this DevOps space, I think it's really important for us to have a certain amount of optimism, right? I mean, and I say this standing here um, as somebody who uh, spent a great deal of time as a sysadmin, which I'm pretty sure means a professional paranoid. Like, I, I was basically paid to think about worst case scenarios all the time. And I think that we can end up really negative if our job is to think about worst case scenarios all the time and then try to guard against them. And that's, it, it can be um, a, a crushing experience, and it can lead to a lot of, you know, on-call PTSD and sadness. And you know, I don't want ops or DevOps or this space to be sadness as a service. Like, I want us to be able to use our superpowers to build the world we want to live in. Um, and that's. <sighs> That brings us to what I mentioned before, which is you can tell by the sparkly t-shirt and the on-brand hair. I don't know if you can tell, but it actually matches. Um, that I work for Microsoft, and that's not a sentence that I imagine I would have said 10 years ago or 10 months ago. And I work for Microsoft because they've actually embraced open source, which is kind of amazing, but awesome. And I literally have a Mac with a Microsoft asset tag on it. And my job is to get people to use Linux on Azure. And it's like, uh, I, I think what I can conclude from this is 2018 is super weird, and we're definitely living in a very weird alternate timeline. There are things about this alternate timeline that I don't like. Um, see also everything in politics. But the, the part where we have all of this collaboration and openness and friendliness and you know giant corporations not just the one I work for but giant corporations contributing to open source projects I like that a lot like I think that's pretty great so if that sounds great to you by the way and if you want to join um, I, I have colleagues here I have my um, my uh, 
colleagues can talk to you about a role similar to what I'm doing that's EU-based. So uh, I recommend you check that out. Um, and in terms of not just Microsoft-related stuff, but in terms of DevOps days stuff, if you're, if you're interested, if you're thinking to yourself, like, she's telling a story of stuff that she's worked on and stuff that she's learned, and I could be doing that. I should be doing that. If you're thinking to yourself that you want to talk to people about these kind of projects, it's not too late to have a conversation here um, in open space about exactly the stuff that you're working on and that you're struggling with. And all of these cities, the CFP is open right now, maybe just for a couple more days. But if you look at devopsdays.org, you could be proposing a talk in a number of these cities or a dozen plus other cities around the world. But these ones are all a reasonable flight from here. So um, I say reasonable flight, and I'm going to Australia in a couple months. These things always seem like a good idea when you sign up for them, and then less so later. Um, so yeah, the this DevOps thing, uh, I mentioned before um, that uh, Patrick Dubois started DevOps Days and um, ran it for the, as the leader of the organization for the first five years. And at DevOps Days in Ghent in 2014, uh, our badges were all a certificate of DevOps, um, which I think means certifying us that we weren't going to, we, we passed kindergarten and we weren't going to eat crayons and we weren't going to you know, hit the other children. Um, but we had a certificate of DevOps that was a little tongue in cheek. And these days, for reasons, there are organizations out there that are offering this sort of certification. And I was pretty against it for a while, just like I was pretty against the term DevOps engineer, even when I, that was my title. Um, but then I've probably, we've all been having these conversations long enough that it's worth mellowing out and being like, you know what, define it however you want, call it whatever you want. Um, I define it as good cross-team collaboration and good use of tools uh, to guide that, to enable that, to help your organization not only eat the delicious dev and ops chocolates. I don't, I don't know if we have DevOps chocolate here. I think there is DevOps beer, right? Because this is, this is Amsterdam, so I'm pretty sure we, I saw, I saw labels that say dev hops, so. Um, but I think it's, we are, we're in a, a watershed moment where everything, you know, um, new and cutting edge and fringe that we've been doing is, hey, look at that, kind of the expected thing. This is not what I, I didn't expect this, and, you know, as a sci-fi reading nerd um, as a child, I did not expect that the biggest blockbusters would be all the Marvel movies. Like, we, I got news for you, the, the nerds have won, and we probably shouldn't screw this up. Like, if we, if we can use the, um, the power that we have, the control that we have over our environments, and the, uh, our ability to shape reality, which, by the way, is kind of amazing. Like, again, read a lot of, of sci-fi, read a lot of fantasy, uh, never thought for a minute that I would be able to use my words to shape reality, but that's what we're doing when we're writing code. Like when we're uh, shaping the world that everyone we know now spends all their time, it seems, use it. We, it was like the 90s and we were on IRC and no one else was doing that. And now everyone is communicating online with people all the time and we're shaping that reality. And that's a, it's a profound and weighty responsibility. And it also means that we have a, we're probably, the people in this room, the people in these conversations are probably the best positioned of anyone to make the world that we're living in the world we want it to be, not the world that other people want it to be or that by default it'll be if we say, not my problem, I'm just gonna keep my head down, I'm just gonna focus on my thing. It's like, mm, we probably don't have that luxury anymore, but we also are empowered to make a lot more change happen than you know, many other folks who are just kind of swept in by the tide and saying, or swept out to sea by the tide and saying, I, I don't know. They don't, if you don't know what you can do, just think the, the one thing you could do, just think of how can I enable someone on another team such that their time is freed up, 
so that they can work on social issues that if they are spending all their time stressing out about work, they are probably not going to be able to spend as much time taking direct action. So that would be, that would be my call to you is you can make everything a little bit better. You can protect everyone a little bit more. Um, and uh, we have, I think we have a great opportunity here today to have these conversations inside our organization and outside. So make sure, if you don't do anything else today, make sure you go to an open space and talk to someone you don't know. You'll definitely learn something. You'll definitely get your own personal improvement from that. So with that, uh, thank you so much. And uh, welcome to DevOps Days. Anyone having questions for Bridget? <laughs> Are we doing questions? We have yeah. a catch yes, box. We do. That's hilarious. Any questions? If anyone can actually catch the box. No questions? No? I think we're okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Bridget.